Hello and welcome. He faced many challenges as he took the oath of office on a Quran, becoming the first Muslim congressman in American politics. In an era of post-9-11 suspicion of anything Islamic, he's had to defend his faith and his patriotism. This week on One on One, meet U.S. Congressman Keith Ellison. As a young man growing up in a large, close family in Detroit, he witnessed the industrial base of his hometown erode. Early on, Keith Ellison took an interest in civil rights and got involved in the community around him. His conversion from Christianity to Islam at the age of 19 only raised interest once he entered the political arena and was sworn into Congress on Islam's holy book, the Quran, in 2006, while America was still suspicious of anything Muslim in the post-9-11 era. Congressman, delighted to have a chance to chat with you. Good to be here. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank so. you. Now, as, uh, are people past the fact that you, you know, you're the first Muslim who was elected to the U.S. Congress, or you know, are there occasions that you have to remind people that being Muslim doesn't mean being anti-American? Well, you know, for my colleagues here in Congress, uh, I think they're pretty much past it. There are occasions where things, you know, pop up, and they come up at unusual times and somewhat unexpected times, but. You know, when, whenever, uh, you know, some, from time to time, the, the, the blogosphere uh, is busy uh, dwelling on this issue of my religion. And, um, and quite frankly, you know, there, there does seem to be a budding industry of people who just sort of work night and day to sort of uh, try to pick at religious tension uh, that might uh, be latent in the country or around the world. And sometimes they use me as 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 the point of, of attack. So, you know, by and large, it's uh, I'm I'm just I'm getting to be a, a regular congressman, and I'm happy to do that. But uh, there are occasions where we have to deal with it. A lot of people outside the U.S. are shocked at how much money is involved in U.S. politics and in, in campaigns and so on. And and there's a feeling, especially in Congress, that people end up having to spend all their time fundraising and campaigning. And it and does it get in the way of the job? Yes, quite frankly. You know, it gets in the way of the job. There are occasions where, uh, you know, it's that I have call time to go raise money on my schedule, and that might come up in the middle of a hearing or anything else. I always say I'll do call time when I'm not doing the job the people sent me here to do, but there's no doubt that there is a tug. Let me take you back. Your family history is uh, fascinating. You were born in uh, Detroit, Michigan. Yes. Uh, in 63, uh, you know, but the industry was very different in those days. Now, what was it like those early years growing up there? Well, you know, I have uh, four brothers, right. and we grew up uh, in, a, you know, a little house, and we uh, are all close, and it was a lot of fun. My parents are attentive. Uh, you know, they were tough on us in terms of homework and studies and stuff like that. We played sports. We had a good time. And, uh, you know, we saw Detroit change. You know, we saw GM, Ford, and Chrysler uh, abandoned our city and we and I remember as a teenager seeing just waves of layoffs almost every day and the city's quite a bit different now it's a shell of what it was your father's a psychiatrist as yeah. well you know and uh, I wonder what influence he had on you <laughs> well you know what my dad is is, is the least uh, uh, academic and formal psychiatrist that there could possibly be he's a fairly informal guy he came up you know uh, from a working class background and he w worked hard went to school and he he got his medical degree and practiced medicine, but uh, he's a very practical guy. I'm, I thank God that I still have him. I can get him on the phone and ask him his views. He's never shy about sharing his views. And uh, you know, he retired, and he had a stroke a few years ago, so he doesn't walk anymore. But uh, he uh, watches uh, Riz Khan. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we keep him, keep him entertained, especially with this interview. Let me ask about your mother. She was a social worker. What yeah. sort of characteristics from her, her personality are, are in you? My mother uh, uh, is believes in service. She believes in the innate dignity of all people, particularly people who have been uh, really challenged by life circumstances. And she believes that everybody can, can, uh, can let their innate creativity, dignity, you know, bring, come forth. So she's cult she's cultivator. She brings it out of people, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, if I could maybe pick up one tenth of that, I'd be so blessed. She still, my mother still works every single day, and uh, she's a, she could retire if she wanted to. She just doesn't want to. She's like, what would I do? And so, uh, my mom is. Uh, I could get her on the phone now. I'm, I'm so blessed to have my parents still. My children could call their grandparents up. It's one of the things that I just thank God for. 
you were the middle one in, yep. in the five. Two older, two younger. <laughs> right. So five boys must have been quite competitive at home. Yeah, it was, and even now it is. <laughs> you know, but we're all tight. You know, and we're good friends, and uh, we uh, play basketball, and you know, whenever we get together, we have a good time. It's interesting, you had activism early in your blood. I know as a, as a youngster, you're out there helping your grandfather in Louisiana with his work with the, uh, the, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, you know, the uh, NA, NAACP. Well, the, the story there is that my grandfather died when my mother was 18, so I never got a chance to actually help him. Oh. But I did get a chance to trace his footsteps and pick up his legacy. My, my grandfather died at the age of 42. My mother was about 18 at the time. He died in a tractor incident that still is clouded in mystery and um I like suspicious death you think well yeah no really body really knows exactly what happened and he was uh one of those people who was incredibly active in rural louisiana pre brown versus board of education pre uh before the montgomery bus boycott of 1955 he was organizing black voters in rural louisiana to vote and you know they received threats they had crosses burned in front of their house and uh, my mother uh, went to a boarding school because they were fearful about what might happen because the people there who uh, had uh, a certain social structure in place uh, based on racial stratification didn't want things to change and would attack anybody who tried to change them. And uh, he was actually uh, a farmer and also a, a, a mechanic and, uh, and a teacher. And he taught at a trade school, taught young men who went into World War II, these are the same young men before uh, Truman uh, made his final decision to de to de uh, to, to desegregate the in the military, my grandfather was teaching young black men who were not full fledged citizens in the military to go serve the United States military, and and so my mother's very proud of this, and so I'm proud of it, and I and I gotta believe that uh, part of what he was doing, part of his commitment, his service, his struggle is hopefully still living on in the work that me and my brothers are doing. It's actually true, you've seen a phenomenal change from your childhood, and in, in certainly in, in, in civil rights and, okay. and the, you know, the, the, the fortunes of African American people. <clears throat> well, you know, the African Americans in America, uh, it's kind of like an ele one crowded elevator that seems like sometimes it's stagnant, and one very uh, sparse elevator that seems like it's going straight to the top. I mean, you know, the, the president, African American, but and many others are doing well as, as well. But, you know, there's no doubt that if you go around the streets of Washington, D.C., or the corner, some parts of Minneapolis or New York or L.A., there's still legions of people who are still looking for and scrounging for real opportunity. Now, what are the social, economic, political implications of that? They're enormous. It's interesting, you were saying your mother was very much into service, and, and I guess some of that came from uh, her faith and her religion. You were born yep. in a, into a Catholic family. Yep. Uh, how, how important was religion and religious rituals in, in your early years in the family? Well, it was extremely important to my mother. And, but my father, it was not important to him. And so my mother would go to church services and bring us along when we were very little. But as we got a little older, my dad said, well, you know, let them decide whether they want to go or not. And we often decided not to go. And you know, my mother was disappointed, but she didn't impose. Uh, and she, but, but, but after a while, you know, I, I watched how my mother would, uh, when she would go out to do her work as a social worker, you know, she kept her rosary beads, which look a lot like vicar beads, you know? And she would say her prayers as she got in and out of her car. And she would say them to herself, very short. And it was clear that her faith and devotion, love, charity, things like that, motivated her work to serve. That had a huge impact on me. So you were 19 years old, Wayne State University in Detroit, and you decided to convert from Catholicism to Islam. I sure did. Well, you know, I, I can't claim that I was the most um, observant Catholic at the time. I had begun to really look around and ask myself about the social circumstances uh, of the country, issues of justice, issues of change. And when I looked at my spiritual life and I looked at what might help inform uh, positive social change, justice in society, I found, I found Islam. So I, uh, I, one day I just, a friend of mine and I were studying calculus or something and he got up and to just leave fairly suddenly. I said, where are you going? He told me, oh, I'm going to prayer. I said, well, what's that about? And he said, I'm going to Juma. I said, what is that about? He said, I'll come see. And I've been going ever since.
Now, it's interesting, it's the Friday prayer, I should point out, the yeah. uh, Juma gathering. Now, um, your brother, one of your brothers is a pastor, actually, at a yeah, Baptist he's a Christian, church. He's a, yeah, he's a ba Christian Baptist uh, minister. He has a large congregation in Detroit, Michigan. We're very close, by the way. He had a, he had a uh, march for women's, uh, for a march against domestic violence, you know, silent no more. And he, he was asking Christians who lived in the community to take a moral and religious stand against the abuse of women. So he calls me to come speak at his, uh, his event. So, you know, and, he, and everybody in Detroit knows that I'm a Muslim. I mean, you know, my, my wedding was done by Imam, you know, because I was 19 when I converted. So, I mean, it's well known. Everybody knows that. But these, these things don't divide us. When I first got elected and there was controversy around me swearing in on the Quran, my brother said, you know what, I'm going to show up at that event with my collar on just to show these people the diversity of our family and then I'm standing with, with my brother. So, you know, we don't have religious strife within our household. And you got to understand, you know, that, that, that my mother's Catholic, my brother's a Protestant Christian and I'm Muslim and so we, right within our own household, but we all get along just fine. And I think our, our house can be a microcosm for society. There's no need for us to fight over these things. It's interesting, after graduating, you married your childhood sweetheart, Kim. Yeah. And your four kids, you're blessed with four kids. Um, you raised them Muslim, but she didn't convert. Well, you know, that's true. She didn't actually stand up and do shahada, but she made sure the, our diet was halal, and she supported the children going to uh, learn Arabic and, you know, Quran at the, at the mosque. And she shows up there and, and visits and is welcome and comfortable there. So we don't make a big deal out of it. She actually acts more Muslim than a lot of Muslims I know. I have more questions for you. We're going to take a short break here. More with Congressman Keith Ellison in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching 101. We're speaking with U.S. Congressman Keith Ellison, the first Muslim elected to the U.S. House of Congress. Now, your, your professional life actually began as a lawyer, uh, specializing in criminal defense, civil rights, and, and education, and oh, sorry, employment. How did, that, how did that experience and that work help you with uh, what you do now? Well, it informed me tremendously, but the truth is my first job out of law school was at a very large law firm where I was doing uh, working for um, the corporate interests, quite frankly. You know, the first three years of my practice, uh, you know, I did, I did as, actually I was assigned to asbestos defense work, which meant that people who, I was defending the company against people who were, who were hit, hurt by asbestos. You know, it's the job I had. Um, but within three years I learned that even though the people at this law firm were good, decent people, and I liked all of them and I got along well, the work wasn't for me. So I, I went to be executive director of the Legal Rights Center, which did the things that you just identified. And we also, we did do education. We had a street law program where we would send lawyers and law students into uh, the most challenged areas of the city to teach young people about the law. I did direct representation of people uh, and you had to be, it was an income qualified program. So you had to be below a certain income to participate in our, in our activities. So You really got to know the people that way. Well, you know what? Uh, I got, to, before I ever asked someone to vote for me, I, I got to the point where I was a, um, I was a familiar face uh, in, in, in the neighborhoods. And, and, that, and, it, and it helped me when I went to run for office. Of course, in 2002, you got elected to the Minnesota House of Representatives. At that time, I mean, first real victory getting into, into the world of politics here. Um, had you set yourself higher goals? Did you know where you were going? No, as a matter of fact, when I ran for office uh, in, in, in 2002, I, I really didn't run because I had some great ambition in politics. I basically recognized that things that I was fighting uh, on, a, on a, an individual basis for as a lawyer, I could perhaps maybe impact the, 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 the legislation to have broader relief for more people. That was sort of my motivation. That's why I sort of moved in the direction of the legislator. So I didn't have any high ideals. And, when, uh, and I had no idea on March 18, 2006, that my predecessor was going to suddenly choose to retire. And so when he did, I was outraged by uh, the Iraq war and very much opposed to that policy. So I decided to dive in simply to increase, improve the quality of the debate, because I thought the people who would win would want to avoid the issue. So I didn't want them to do that. So I got into the race. And well, the rest is history. 
2006 for the first Muslim elected to the U.S. House, of, you know, to the U.S. Congress. Why did it take so long? Do you think? You know, I think that um, it was really more a function of uh, the community uh, getting to the point where we're ready. I mean, um, you know, the, the fact is a lot of African American Muslims sought Islam out as a refuge from what they believe was an intolerant uh, society that they were living in. It was a refuge, and, 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 and that caused people to disengage and not participate and say, this society is racist and, and not for us, and so we're going to pull apart. Now, I was never a part of that strain, but the roots of that are, are there. And then the other side of the Muslim community was the immigrant community, and immigrants typically, and my wife comes from an immigrant family, uh, typically um, work on education and business, and then their children get into politics. And so um, this is a community, both two communities that were politically sort of demobilized, and uh, so it took a while before the community emerged to the point where it's like, hey, you know, we should get involved. Interestingly enough, your uh, 2006 campaign was nearly hurt by articles you'd written uh, while at law school in support of uh, Louis Farrakhan, the uh, controversial leader of the Nation of Islam. Uh, and a lot of people, of course, controversy around Islam often was associated with that as well. Do you regret writing those articles? Well, you know what? I wrote those articles out of a spirit that um, the black community was in a very difficult straits in the 80s and 70s, and that there was this movement that was saying, hey, look, pick yourselves up, we have to have justice, we have to have fairness. And I don't think I was nearly critical enough about some of the uglier aspects of the message. And as I got older, I said, you know what? You, you can't do a good thing the wrong way. And so, you know, it's regret, you know, for the time I was in, that was, the, that was where I was. Uh, as I got uh, a little older, and, you know, into my professional life, I came to some new realizations. So I don't have any regrets. I will say that, uh, you know, that, you know, people develop, people grow, people emerge, and who I am at, who I was at 18, 19, 20 is not who I was at 40 and 41. And I think it's uh, a little ridiculous for people to assume that people don't change. But at the same, but you know, uh, that's how it is. Did you ever expect to witness the first black president of America? No, I didn't expect it, but I didn't think it was out of the realm of possibility. You know, I always thought to myself that uh, America is a fundamentally not, you know, I mean, it's, America's a fundamentally fair country, you know, and uh, this is a country that responds to achievement, quite frankly. And, uh, I, 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 you know, so a person with the right combination of skills could, could do it. And Barack Obama came along, he had good timing, you know, and he had a uh, a great message. He has a, a, a level of genius at delivering that message, and uh, he uh, he was he was in the right moment. He ran a phenomenal campaign. So did his opponent, but his campaign was more tech savvy, more nimble, more agile. They had a strategic strategy. Now. I'm fully aware of some of the ridiculous questions you've, you've faced in the media in America, you know, being a threat to the country, are you working with the enemy and things like these that people oppose to you. And I asked you at the beginning of the interview about, you know, the, the issue of, of uh, people, how they regard you now. Do, you. do you feel, honestly, attitudes are changing? Is everything moving in the right direction when it comes to understanding, you know, African-American leadership and, and religious leadership and faith, you know, based uh, politics? Things are moving in the right direction, but not in the linear way. You know, there are fits and starts, setbacks, and, and, and moves forward. You know, so if you're looking for linear progress, that isn't there. But over time, things are clearly moving in the right direction. You know, you look in terms of the issue, just racial tolerance. I mean, this country has gone from a point where, you know, we had slavery, then Jim Crow, and now we have social and legal, we have legal equality, if not social. Uh, and so, we don't have economic, you know, equality, but we have. Uh, but nobody can. Anyone who stands before a court, it's got to be treated the same. And there is redress for people who are when they're not. So clearly, the country is moving in the right direction. But for but 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 clearly, you know, uh, every day you can point out how we're having fits and starts when it comes to religious tolerance. You know, quite frankly, with all of the problems that we've had in the United States, I have to say the United States handles religious tolerance pretty well. By comparison, 
foreign policy obviously is something that you're often having to, to address, uh, mm. American foreign policy. Um, in fact, you and a, and, and a group of others were arrested in April of 2009 for uh, standing up and, and outside the Sudanese embassy in, in the, for the rights of the people of Darfur. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, and to get arrested for it too, are you having, uh, you know, is it having to, are you having to take that kind of, of action? Well, you know what? Uh, I did receive criticism for that, for being arrested and uh, uh, in, in, de in defense of the people of Darfur. And um, the fact is, is that before that day, uh, Darfur wasn't on the newspa newspaper pages. It was there in the back page in a, in a one-inch story. And after me and four of my colleagues took that stand in front of the Sudanese embassy, it was uh, all day uh, in the news cycle. And so it was, sometimes you do have to, you know, step out there uh, for the right cause, you know. And uh, I, I didn't just go out and get arrested. I actually gone to Darfur. I've gone to southern Sudan. I've tried to be a force of positive uh, change there. And, th and that's a difficult situation. Of course, you're, you're still a very young man and young in politics as well. Do you see yourself doing anything else? Do you have any other ambitions? Yeah, I, 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 not, not uh, outside of my present job. I mean, I, I don't know. We'll see where it takes, it takes me. But I do have goals within the position I'm in now. And one is I would like to see the world emerge to a point where reconciliation and mediation of conflict is, plays a far more prominent role than it does now. I want to help do that. I'd like to see us come to a new understanding about peace, security, and the duty to protect. I think nations around the world have a duty to protect vulnerable populations, but the problem is, how do we do it without, um, without sort of an imperialist uh, sort of, sort of uh, approach? And of course, the world is suspicious because we do have this history. In dealing with all these big things, of course, your, your pace of life is crazy as a congressman. Do you ever get downtime? Do you get time for Keith Ellison? Uh, I've heard of this concept. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> How would you like to be remembered? What would you like your Ooh, legacy to be? I haven't even, I've never thought of that. Um, just hopefully, you know, I did the best I could with what I had. Congressman, honored to speak with you. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Liz.